Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of the Marine and Reef podcast by MarineandReef.com. I'm your host, Jared Hudson, and today I brought with me um, my good long-term friend, um, Gavin Rodrigo with Aquarium Arts. Um, so, so, Gavin, you want to introduce yourself, tell people who you are and what you do? Yeah, so, like you said, my name is Gavin. Um, I'm one of the owners at Aquarium Arts. Um, it's a family-owned business. Um, we've been around for a very long time. Um, my dad bought the company in 1986, and um, you know, at one point, I, I've known Jaron a long time. I think I met him when I was probably 10 years old. He had he had worked for my dad at one point, and. Um, yeah, just been doing this most of my life. So. Yeah, so you have a, a walk-in fish store, but you also have an online um, through Reef Hotspot? Yes, yeah. So Aquarium Arts is our retail front. That's the big old established store that's everybody knows and loves and it's been around for a long time. And then Reef Hotspot's my online store. We're, we're working out the kinks, you know, it's still kind of in the prototype phase, you know. So I, I ship and stuff and done most selling on eBay for now, but... Um, yeah, if you're interested in anything we have to offer, you know, if you see, um, say you follow us after this podcast and you see something you like, just send us a message. We can see about shipping it to you if you're not in Arizona. Now, uh, Gavin, one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on today is I thought I wanted to talk about um, coral coloration. We've noticed that we have lots of customers who call on the phone asking, how do I get bright, colorful corals? And um, on our website, we've had articles about coral coloration, and they are some of the most trafficked. We can tell that how to get colorful corals is something a lot of people are interested in. But I know I don't um, sell corals. We don't have them here. I sell fish stuff, not actual fish or corals. But I know, having worked for your dad before, that you guys have been doing what you're doing for almost 40 years now. Yeah, you have a lot of great. people, you have it in your blood, you sell online, and I thought you are definitely someone who would know about how to get some bright, colorful corals. So I have some things that I thought mattered, and at least what I usually go over with people and kind of wanted your opinion on it. Um, the first thing I usually tell people is that basically Instagram is not real. Like if you're seeing pictures of corals online, those pictures are edited, they've had the saturation turned up, they're super zoomed in, they've taken like 40 pictures yeah. and picked the best one. So I guess the first thing I tell people is like, just have proper expectations because you're not gonna get that in real life all the time. Yeah, and I, I'd say for the most part, I agree. Obviously, you know, it depends on the vendor. Um, you know, with, with me, for example, you know, obviously I'll, I'll use a DSLR to yeah, take that pictures. Nice camera. Yeah, nice camera, nice lens. Um, and then, you know, I'll do editing. I don't really do saturation. I do, um, oh, I forget what it is. It's not saturation. Well, the color balance is probably the most important balance, thing. Yeah, color um, balance. Yeah. And then there's also um, like um, vibrance. Yeah. So a lot of times with the way our store is lit and the way that our tanks are, like we have like these like gray tubs are kind of mostly what our corals are in. And, it, it tends to make everything look purple, so I have yeah. to click the violet, the vibrance up a little bit. But I always try to have the um, coral nearby while I'm editing, so I get it as close as possible. But um, you know, some sometimes like certain colors, you just can't get them out of it. And I'm not a professional photographer or anything, but um, I always try to do my best. And uh, if you, you know, a lot of times too, like if you're say you're buying online or uh, you see a post or something, you know. Don't be afraid to ask someone like, hey, can you uh, turn the light up a little bit? Can you show it to me? Or, or ask like, is it, is it really like kind of orange or is it, is it like say it's a torch coral or is it, or is it gold torch? Um, so questions like that, you know. Most vendors will be more than happy to help you with that sort of stuff. Yeah, and I kind of want to be clear because I mean, we've all taken pictures of our tanks and I think it's totally fair to say you need some photo editing. And the biggest reason is because um, whether it's your phone camera or if it's your DSLR, nice camera, um, all cameras are made to take pictures under basically sunlight. Mm -hmm. And then all of our reef tanks we put this like super blue light on it and they're just not designed to take pictures yeah. under that. Yeah. So you gotta do some editing, but it needs to be um, faithful editing yeah. where you're trying to accurately represent it. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, 
people who aren't selling corals, it's really fun to make them look really cool and, yeah. and post, and that's fine. But just understand that, you know, if you're wondering why in real life your corals don't look like that, uh, it's because that photo isn't real life. Exactly. Uh, it's something someone put on Instagram totally. or wherever. Yeah. So, so Gavin, um, you actually came to me and said, this is something you wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. And that is that before we get into ways of trying to get your corals to look certain ways or how to build some color, you mentioned that, well, if they're not healthy and happy, then they, they look like crap. You know, yeah. They look pretty bad. Yeah, it doesn't matter what you um, do. So, so since you brought it up, what are you seeing with that? What does that look like for you? Yeah, so I think a lot of people just like when they start the reef tank off in the first place, they always wait till the last minute possible to buy alkalinity test kit, a calcium test kit, and a magnesium test kit. It's always like the last thing they buy. Um, and I, I've, I think maybe that, you know, maybe that's like on my, on my problem as like a retailer, like maybe I should be more clear, like, hey, you know, you really can't keep corals alive if, if these levels aren't in check. So, you know, maybe we could do a better job of that. But um, the reality is, is if they're not in safe ranges, um, so, you know, your alkalinity, 7 to 12, your calcium, you know, I like to have it above 400, um, 400 to 500, and then magnesium above 1300, if I can, 1280, kind of the minimum there. I've gotten as low as 1100 before we had issues there, but um, if, if you're not in those ranges and you're not consistent, then it's really hard for corals to do well um, in the first place, and, you know, that's not even talking about... Um, pests? Do you have fish in your tanks that are going to eat the corals you've got in there? Um, is um, yeah, yeah. I'll just stop there for now. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd echo all of that. Um, I mean, the point of this is not to do like a reef keeping fundamentals, mm -hmm. but one thing I always say is, if you want to know if your corals are healthy, it's are they growing? And it's generally animals. If they're struggling to stay alive, they'll just stay alive. But once they really start throwing, they'll start growing. And if they're really happy, they'll reproduce and they'll spawn. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if your corals are slowly melting away, dwindling away, because your chemistry's out of whack, because someone's pecking on them, because they have a pest, because there's not adequate lighting, um, they're gonna look pretty bad because they're not healthy at all. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess is uh, what I just wanna say is like, before we go into all these ways of trying to tweak how the corals look, try to first make sure that they're growing and not dying. <laughs> and yeah. once you're there, there's kind of some next steps you can take to make things a little bit better. Absolutely. And so I guess if we're assuming someone has corals that are healthy, that they're growing, they're doing good, um, usually the first thing I tell them is to look at lighting. Um, there's kind of like two parts to lighting and we're going to talk about the first one. Um, and that is that the only reason you can see anything in your tank is because there's lights on your tank. And if you have a blue light on your tank, it's going to look way different than if it's a white light. It's going to look different with all the shades in between. It's going to look different if it's a T5. It's going to look different if it's a metal halide or an LED. And um, it can make some corals just look like garbage based on this. Absolutely. Um, so I, I see you smiling, Gavin. Yeah. But I mean, one of the things for me, is some of my favorite corals are things like um, yellow leather coral, Fiji yellow leather, the hot pink bird's nest. I really like some of the. I knew you were gonna say yeah. these corals. I yeah, the, you the purple discosoma, which is an old one, but they are yeah. really purple. Yeah. And if you light your tank with like the Windex blue lighting, they look like crap. Yeah, they, they just, just look so bad. They just look like rock. You don't even you don't even see them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, there's a lot of things that look better under blue as well. A lot of the fluorescent greens and oranges and reds do look good. Um, so, as somebody who sells coral, is this something you ever come across, or someone just buys something, takes it home, and it's like that's not the same thing? Yeah, it's um, it can be a little tough sometimes, you know. And and you know, you mentioned the different like types of lighting, like halide versus T5 versus LED. Um, but even like within LEDs between brands, right? Yeah. So like like um, Kessel, for example, right? In Kessel, you got your spectral controller here. Um, they have the the tuna blue. It's like a it's 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 a deep blue, but it's not like Windex blue, for example. Yeah. And then if, if you compare that to say like, um, I don't know, a Red Sea light, that's just another light product that, that we sell at Aquarium Arts. Um, 
the, the red sea lights tend to be a little more purple. Yeah. And more so vibrant. like customers I've sold like a red sea setup to, you know, a whole shebang with all the products they have out. Um, those will tend to have a hard time like going from like the Kessel lighting with like say for example a gold torch and you know gold torches there's all these different colors and then like the Dragon Soul 24k and you name it and they'll take it home and be like oh I already have that one <laughs> and it's like it's, so it can be a little hard I, I just had this kind of experience on Saturday with the customer he's like he's like do you know which one and he showed me a picture of it and I'm like dude it's hard to tell so yeah. yeah that's that's even something that that tends to happen as well just between light brands and then even if it is the same light brand like what percentage are they running their blue on what percentage are they running their white uh even intensity can kind of affect um how the coral responds to the light how it emits um all those sorts of things lots of factors yeah so kind of two recommendations i have is nowadays almost everybody's on some kind of led light um, I've used Kessel for a very long time. Um, Kessel has a spectral controller and they also have a, a Wi-Fi dongle. But there's a lot of other um, different lights out there. I know there's like the Zet light lights, the Hagen has some lights. They're, pretty much all of them are controllable. So one of my recommendations is it's very likely that in your tank there's going to be some corals that look really good under certain lighting and other corals that look really bad under that lighting. But the nice thing with all these controllable lights is you can change the color throughout the day. So you can ramp them up and down to get a sunrise and sunset, but on all my tanks, like my desk tank, I start out with like a nice 10K light and the purple mushrooms look really good under that 10K. And then right when I'm about to leave the office, I have it go really blue and actinic and all the fluorescent zoos and things just look so much better. Um, so I would just say, Try to have a variety of spectrums so you can enjoy different things looking good in different color settings. Yeah. And another thing I'd say is just ask whoever's um, selling you that coral how they're lighting it. Mm -hmm. um, w w ask what settings they're using, what settings the pictures were under, or if you're in person, what settings are on the light right now so you can see if you have something comparable. Yeah. And so Gavin, ahead of time, we were both talking about lighting. And we both agreed that lighting really affect how your corals look in your tank. Um, but one thing we were discussing is there's a lot of people who believe that it's not just if you shine this light, the coral looks different. They actually believe that the coral will change colors based on the lighting that's hitting that coral. Um, I don't know if you've seen this. I know the theory behind this is that corals, just like humans, create pigment to actually protect them. The, the corals, just like we start to tan when you're exposed to UV light and you develop skin pigment. A lot of these corals color pigments are actually the corals trying to block specific wavelengths and then they secrete say a green pigment to block blue. There's actually some evidence of that, that your green corals will get brighter fluorescent green because they're trying to shield themselves from too much blue. Um, so is it something you've experienced or you've noticed I grew this coral here under this light I'm growing it under this light and now it looks very different yeah so there is um, like that that OG mummy chalice I think the trade name might even be like pumpkin patch chalice yeah. right where it's it's a uh, it's a for those of you who don't know what we're talking about it's like a purple chalice with orange eyes on it and in some of our systems like when we put it under um, our T5s which we run um, ATI Blue Plus and what's the other one you sell? I think it's Actinic. Actinic yeah. yeah, I do Blue Plus and Actinic. And um, it turns to like a, a teal green with pink centers in, in that system. And then if I frag it um, and I move it to um, a different system that's got just LEDs on it, um, maybe the lighting's just a little different, it'll go back to that original purple, orange, and maybe a little blue ring on the outside as it as it grows um and that's my experience with it i was actually just last night i was watching a video um that top shelf aquatics put out um and they have their their bill murray acro very popular famous acro and they showed three different shots in different intensity right and you can see kind of what jaron's talking about where certain colors are coming out um and not only did they change the intensity, it was different wavelengths. And you could tell that these were big colonies in different systems yeah. with different 
different um, spectrums that they they were shooting these videos. So yeah, definitely, I think there is some evidence to that. As far as like direct scientific research, I haven't read a whole ton about it, but I've seen it firsthand. Yeah, I, I mean, a lot of this is how much money are people going to pay to figure out how to do this yeah, exactly. aquarium hobby thing. Exactly. <laughs> but I'll say that one of my favorite corals is um, there's a coral that I actually grew a lot in the store. It's very common, it's just a, a version of a red cap or orange cap. Mm -hmm. And I say or because I know that same coral, I've put it in multiple tanks and in some tanks it's like really orange and some tanks it's really red. And I think a lot of it is the lighting. Yeah. It seemed like back when I grew it under halides, it looked really red. But in most of my LED tanks now, it's much more orange. And um, we don't really know exactly why this is, but the theory is that basically when the coral is exposed to a certain wavelength, it secretes a pigment to try to protect itself, just like we tan. So the advice I'd have for most people, if you're like, I really want to have the most colorful corals, is to try to get the most broad spectrum lighting you can get. Um, and maybe you say, well, I don't like looking at it. Well, the great thing is with modern controllable LEDs, <laughs> like the Kessels or the Red Seas or any, any of the others, you can change it. So if you don't like looking at the tank under a full spectrum look, just have that go while you're out of town. You know, like if, if you're at work during the middle of the day, have the full spectrum light during the middle of the day, and you can turn it really blue in the evening if that's what you like. Um, and also, um, we talked earlier, they talked about the T5s. T5s just are more full spectrum than LEDs. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if, if you don't have T5s, there's like this, Aquatic Life has those hybrid fixtures. They're gonna be a broader spectrum and you could add some retrofits up there. Um, but just giving your corals a more broad spectrum tends to color them up. Yes, absolutely. Um, another coral I want to mention because I haven't had it in years and it's getting really hard to find is the Fiji yellow leather, which I think I talked about earlier. Um, yellow is my favorite color and there's almost no yellow corals. Yeah. Those Fiji yellow leathers back in the metal halide days yeah. were like screaming in your face canary yellow. They were like as yellow as a yellow tang. And since I've seen them under LEDs, I've never seen them as yellow. They look kind of like an orangey, just duller. Yeah. And I, I believe Jake Adams, before he passed, he used to tell me he thinks it's the green wavelength that a lot of LEDs don't have yeah. that made them yellow. So it just kind of goes to show you, like, I don't have the green channels in my LED lights turned up like at all. You know, maybe I should turn them up at least when I'm not looking at the tank. If I don't like how that green looks, I should at least give the tank some green light in hopes that it can encourage some colors to yeah. show up. Did I tell you uh, Fiji's opening back up? Did I tell you that? Oh, no. Yeah, just got an email a week or two ago that... Um... Well, you need start. some Fiji yellow others. I know, so that's yeah, like my, start, one of my favorites. We're going to start collecting. That's funny that you mentioned that. Yeah, maybe in the next month or so, we'll start to, we'll get a shipment of those, see how they do. Cool. Yeah. So if someone's, you know, got proper expectations, they're not expecting Instagram corals, they've got their lighting, right they're getting a nice broad spectrum lighting to have it tuned to where the stuff looks good often the next thing i talk about is uh, the nutrient levels in the tank and gavin when we talked earlier you were like absolutely and you are a particularly a big fan of amino acids yeah. uh, so do you use amino acids or what do you find you get when you use yeah them? we use we use amino acids almost every day in the store um you know even on like wild corals that have just come in We'll dip them in amino acids, and um, we'll use like an iodine solution too. So the iodine, um, I don't know the exact like, science yeah. on this. Um, I don't, you know, mostly we use the iodine to kind of kill any pests. That's you use antibacterial. You know, yeah. We use like coral RX and other stuff too to kill like flatworms or whatever, right? Um, and but the iodine works as an antibacterial, and then um, also like I think you talked to me about this. Like, six months ago but when you do like your icp your icp um like a lot of times the iodine comes back low so we use iodine there as well yeah so so um, yeah i think what you're talking about gavin is like with uh, iodine is often bundled with amino acids yeah. so here i have some acro power yeah. um that's probably about the oldest original amino acid yeah. this is like the first one i remember coming out Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have uh, iodine bundled with it, but a lot do. Yeah. I think, um, I know some of the Seachem ones have it bundled with it. Yeah. I think Red Sea has them bundled with it. So they kind of often come in the same package. Yeah. Um, 
but it's kind of hard for me to explain to people what amino acids are. And um, generally what I tell people is it's kind of like protein powder. Yeah. <laughs> so what well, little bit of organic chemistry I know is yeah. that proteins are the building blocks of the cell, the parts of the cell that do stuff. Yeah. And the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. Yeah. So like when, you, when you're a lifter and you take your protein powder, it's to build your muscles. Well, the corals are a lot simpler animals than us. So instead of giving them the protein, we give them amino acids or the building box of yeah. protein. And it, it can really make a big difference in how the corals look. Yeah. It's not just the color, but like just the, the polyp extension and just fleshiness and puffiness exactly. of the corals when you give them aminos is a lot better. Yeah, and so like to what you were saying about, you know, that's what they call like, I don't know. It's part of like the whole central dogma of biology, right? You've got like, even like down on the cellular level, you've got like the nucleotides and all that stuff. I don't want to get too confusing for people, right? Us ASU bio guys here. <laughs> um, but, you know, amino acids, there's only a set amount of them on earth. And, and I believe it's either 20 or 28. I always forget. I'm watch me be completely wrong it's neither of those but there's a set amount of them and they're the same amino acids that are used for all biological organisms on earth and it really just comes down to the concentrations um, that are found in different environments so you know the amino acid makeup of you know your bicep is going to be once they break the protein down it's going to be different than the amino acid breakup of an aquaphore um, so, and they, you know, so like our, my thought process when we're dipping the corals in amino acids and iodine is, you know, we're, we're killing any pests, we're killing any bacterial infection. If it's a nasty enough, anti um, um, sorry, bacterial infection, you'll have to use maybe an antibiotic. That's kind of taboo. Some people get really mad about that. Um, and then we supply the amino acid to help rebuild any tissue rebuild the tissue so even after fragging sometimes we'll let them soak in amino acids too yeah if you haven't tried any amino acid i'd recommend you try one there's a there's a lot to go with um and make it nerd out more there's like essential amino acids which are amino acids that the corals can't make yeah and there's non-essential amino acids which are amino acids that the coral is able to produce out of constituent products, which basically means maybe they didn't actually eat that amino acid, but they ate some similar things. They can yeah. convert them inside their bodies to yeah. build them. Um, but you just gotta think of it again like protein powder. Yeah. It's not really a food, but it kind of is. It's a dietary supplement for corals. It makes them look a lot yeah. better. Um, there's a lot to choose from. What I've always liked about the AcroPower is you don't need to refrigerate it. So it's one of the best to just put on a dosing pump, which is typically how I dose mine because I, when I was working at Aquarium Arts and I was paid to put things in every day, that was one thing, but now it's like dad life and I'm just gonna get the dosing pump, yeah. and put it on and add it every day. You know, I've never used AcroPower. <laughs> I've never done it, actually. I've always used other products. Well, I mean, I'll have to try it. I'll yeah, I know, it. like when I was at the shop, I didn't use AcroPower. I usually use like the, I think I used some of the Brightwell aminos or some others, yeah. and I just mix it in with the fish food. Yeah. And then you just squirt the fish food into all yeah. the tanks. That also works well, but at home, I, maybe it's a lazy factor. <laughs> it's just nice to put it on a dosing pump and add it. Yeah. Um, the other thing I want to talk about was there's a lot of talk now with how your nitrogen and phosphate levels, nitrate and phosphate levels, affect your corals, coloration. And uh, this has been around for a while, but it reminds me back of, I mean, this is years ago to when Zeovit was really hot. Yeah. So for those who have never seen a Zeovit tank, Zeovit was this reef keeping method out of Germany that was around at least 10 years ago. And they'd have all these pictures of corals that just looked like like Easter colors. Like they were so pastel that they seemed like unreal and it, fake. It looked cool, but but you know, as we've learned. It was not normal. Yeah, it was not, a you know, yeah, kinda like nuclear cool waste look, can look cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, same thing, yeah. Is so um, what we've kinda learned is that those Zeovit systems and other systems like that, for a while it was a fad to have other what they call ultra low nutrient systems tends to give you very pastel colors. Um, whereas generally as your nutrient levels, particularly nitrates and phosphates go up, yeah. you tend to get darker colors. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say better colors. But if you go too far, everything turns brown and then it looks ugly. Yeah, and a lot of that is, you know, kind of the, the biology of corals in the first place. So you've got your coral and it's got that symbiotic relationship with the zooxanthellae. And you know what happens is the coral it kind of controls the amount of zooxanthellae 
in like in the coral itself, right? And obviously the zooxanthellae is doing the photosynthesis. Um, zooxanthellae is naturally brown by color. So a lot of times if your, your nitrate and phosphate get really high, um, you know, usually like, like 0 0.9, 1.0, and nitrates really high and then obviously you know there's those guys that be like you know i got my yeah, there's nitrate always someone yeah, there's, there's always outside. someone like it looks ridiculous but there's other research behind that as well but if it's not in the right ratios the corals will turn brown um yeah and i think some of like the best evidence of this is um i guess on the other side the browning is when they have too much but if you've seen pictures of a bleached reef that's when all the zooxanthellae has been kicked out of the coral yeah and basically the coral is clear, so you see white, you see the white skeletons. Yeah. Um, so if, if, you, if you bleach the coral by you know, going too low in nutrients or too much light, you get no color. So, so much of the coral's color comes from the zooxanthellae, the symbiotic um, algae inside the coral's yeah. tissues. Um, and that's what happens when you get the nutrients very low. The reason they look pastel is you have less zooxanthellae. Mm -hmm. And when you have the nutrients too high, they get brown because you kind of have an overabundance. So we're yeah. shooting for somewhere in the middle. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and it's hard to know. Um, you know, I talked about, I talk, had this conversation with Lou over at Tropic Marin mm -hmm. about like how, how do we know like how well a tank's doing with like your water chemistry. Like there's no way to know for sure unless you document it and try it like can my tank look this much better if i bump my nitrate by five and my phosphate by 0.1 or it's, it's really hard to know so i think really for most people it's just find something you're happy with and just enjoy it and maintain it and be consistent and you'll you'll be successful you know one thing i get pushed to a lot is um i tend to say you know it's somewhere in the middle and it's good and I've realized talking to customers like they need some number for yeah, me to give them. Exactly. So yeah. usually for what I for yeah what I usually tell people if you're a beginner is I like to have my nitrates at 20 or below, but not zero. Zero is bad. You'll get bleached corals. And I like my phosphates to um, kind of similarly be um, below 0.2, um, but not zero. And zero is bad. And it used to be in the Ziovit days, everybody was trying to get everything low. Now there's a lot of people who have problems with nutrients being too low. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of why I brought these um, Brightwell products, the Neonitro and Neophos. This is basically phosphate in a bottle and nitrate in a bottle. So if you have the opposite problem, uh, instead of nutrients being too high, they're bottoming out, coral are bleaching, or just looking really pastel, um, using the Neonitro and Neophos are a way to get it up. But I'd agree kind of what you said, where, before I bought these, I would just feed my fish more. I would just like double the feedings. Um, but I've had some people say, I'm feeding my fish four times a day and the nutrients are still zero. Yeah. Like, well, okay, maybe you need some neonitro and neophos to bump yeah. that up a little bit. Well, and the other thing too is like, you know, that the readings you take of nitrate and phosphate, that's just like what's in the water column right there. Yeah. Um, for example, we have a Red Sea display at Aquarium Marts that does not fall into the parameters Jaren just mentioned. Yeah. So like the nitrate is one, I tested it yesterday, and the phosphate is, um, what was it? It was 0.1. Point one. So it was, yeah, it was a lot lower than what Jaren's saying. But we're carbon dosing that tank. So a lot of the nitrate and, and phosphorus that are you know, on average in the water column are being consumed by bacteria and then those bacteria are either being consumed by the corals or they're being skimmed out. So that nutrition is still going to the corals because we're carbon dosing the aquarium. So that's that's another factor. You know, if you were just using GFO to rip it out and you had the same levels I did in the same tank with the same lighting, you might not have the same look. Yeah, and I think Maybe I just, we can show a picture of how that tank looks. Yeah, right now it was, you guys we'll see by. if we can edit it in for you yeah. guys so you can see it. Yeah. Um, the other illustration I would tell people is, you know, say I put a chunk of fish food in, say it's something big, you know, like maybe it's a silver side I'm feeding a eel or a lionfish or something. Well, obviously, where that is, there's a ton of nitrate and phosphate. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that an inch over in the water column, there's any nitrate and phosphate. Exactly. So what we've kind of found is you don't want zero nitrate and phosphate in the water column, but nutrients isn't just how much nitrate and phosphate's in the water column. It's also how much 
nutrients the coral are getting. So, you know, if you're target feeding all your corals and your nutrient levels are low yeah. in the water column, that may be okay. Wasn't your, um, one of the ICPs that Fauna Marin puts out, isn't, doesn't it like actually like test the total organic and tell you that? Yeah, so we doesn't were going to test, um, so you should be monitoring your nutrient levels, your nitrate yeah. and phosphate levels. Yeah. Um, you can do home test kits, but one thing I like about Fauna Marin is they do an ICP test and generally the way an ICP test works, it's basically they vaporize your, you send in a test to a lab and they kind of basically vaporize it, run it through their ICP machine. But when they do that, you can't test for compounds, only elements. Because so by the time they vaporize it, is my understanding, um, anything that was a compound is gone. So when you say nitrate and phosphate, phosphate's PO4, that's a compound. Um, they, in addition to doing ICP, do an actual test. I assume it's a titration based test. But that's a good way to get a lab result where if you're wondering if your tests are correct, um, you can get kind of a lab that you can trust to give you uh, a test result, letting you know those nitrate and phosphate levels um, beyond just what you're doing at home. Yeah, and, and definitely like, I'll say this too, make sure like if you're doing ICP tests, just keep using the same company because not every company is gonna test it the same way. So. Yeah. So Gavin, when I was thinking of things to tell people about how to color up their corals, one thing that I've read a lot about, and I've, I guess, had some experience with, has been trace elements and how they affect coral color. But I guess if I'm honest with you, and we had talked ahead of time, um, whatever difference I notice in trace elements is really minimal, but yet there's some people who just swear by them. I found I some. I found I some do articles. Swear by trace elements. I do swear. Well, I, I I don't. I wouldn't swear they're not important. But um, I, I've read some articles um, on this topic from people I know are more advanced hobbyists than me that are like, if you bump your potassium, immediately all your pinks look better. And um, I haven't noticed that. I, I've known that when I've found some trace element levels to be low, things seem ha happier, healthier, and grow faster when they're in normal ranges. But I haven't necessarily noticed like a one-to-one -one correlation. Like if I want more orange, I dose more iodine. I, I don't seem to get a direct correlation like that. Yeah, I, I never look at it like that. Yeah, <laughs> I never do that. You know, like, um, for example, you know, there's like reef moonshiners that are out there. Um, every tank I've seen that does the reef moonshiner method looks incredible. Um, I have no like affiliation with them. Never used the product, but. Um, from those of you, for those of you who aren't familiar, that's basically ICP test, and then they send you basically every trace element you can. Yeah, so they and, do the test and they come yeah, and, and, and you know, Fauna Marin does the same thing kind yeah. of as well. Yeah, it's pretty pretty similar. The, the the approach is they test it for you, they tell you how much you should dose to get it back to normal, and then the colors come back. Um, in in my experience, I'd say like. A lot of the big companies out there, um, they have, you know, they have like a reef care program and then they've got a, you know, how do we balance our trace element dosage with our calcium alkalinity magnesium dosage, right? Um, so I'll just use, in my thought, you know, I don't know if you guys saw Red Sea. So yeah, so the Red Sea has, they basically have like four trace element supplements. Yeah. And then they say, based on how much you dose of your, I think it's your calcium, calcium. and alkalinity. Yeah, so one to 10. This is the amount you dose. Um, and others do something similar, like yeah. um, Two Little Fishies or ESV. They just build trace elements into their two part. Yeah. Um, so there's different ways of kind of integrating yeah. the trace elements with your regular um, major element supplement. Yes, yeah. So I have found trace elements to work really well. Oh, and before I get off topic, he did mention something that some products integrate the trace elements into their yeah. supplements. So that's why it's, it's really important not to mix and match brands for like, I personally would not use like, say Red Sea Calcium and then use Sea Chem's alkalinity component. Um, and I had a lady that was coming to my store pretty regularly and she was doing that. She was actually using like Red Sea Calcium and then Sea Chem's alkalinity, and she was finding that her trace elements of certain ones were just in toxic levels. Um, and that was the only thing we could possibly think was that, you know, for 
whatever reason, because these these you know these carbonate ions and these calcium, like if there's a product blend that's designed together, it's designed to be used at certain yeah. ratios. And then if they mix in trace elements into it, it's made to work well. So I know I'm saying Red Sea a lot, but that's yeah. just the one on my mind. So they say it'll, it's a calcium component with other reef building elements, it'll say. And so if you're if you're mixing brands, you might not you might be actually throwing off your trace element blend, and then your corals, the skeletons, might not be able to form properly. And I think it even goes beyond that. Like I've had customers complain. Um, say when they buy ESV Bionic or, or the other one I mentioned, the two little fishies, which are a two part um, with integrated trace elements, they'll say, why do I always have to buy both bottles? I always use more of one part than the other. And um, don't do that. <laughs> like don't use more in one part than the other because you may think of it as just calcium and alkalinity, yeah. but there's a whole bunch of other things mixed in there. So if you use them in uneven ratios, you're not just adding more, say, alkalinity. Yeah. You're adding more of a whole bunch of other trace elements, and it can really throw things out of whack. Like you need to use those bottles in yeah. equal proportions. Yeah. Um, there, there's some brands that will say this product is just pure um, buffer, and if you got something that's just pure buffer, you can't mess it up. But I whenever you dose, yeah, if you ever dose anything that's integrated, you kind of want to commit to the system and try to use it in even ratios, like the manufacturer recommends. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty important and. A lot of people just would kind of overlook like that. They'd just be like, well, I'm putting alkalinity in. Well, you know, the trace elements are pretty important there. So um, another part about trace elements, and sorry to kind of no, lead good. on this one, but um, is water changes. Yeah. And so, you know, you've got the guys that are like, I never do water changes. My reef tank looks amazing. Well, there are um, nuances. So say you're someone where um, but say the store you're buying from, right, tends to have a lot of um, wild corals, for example. Um, you know, and there's everybody's got their opinion on this, right? Yeah. Wild or mariculture and tank grown, right? There's all the different. There's pros and cons to everything, right? Um, if you know, th say they've got a tank that's like fully grown out, and they're like, I never do water changes. They might just have a bunch of captive grown corals yeah. that are like pretty close to bulletproof. Um, whereas if you got corals that haven't been in captivity for as long, they are used to perfect natural seawater. Um, so, and, and that's kind of where I'm going with this is, if you're doing water changes, you know, for the beginner, it's more about like taking out nitrate and phosphate, keeping the water clean. But eventually, you know, you hit a point where the tank's pretty stable and a water change, it's, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't, it kind of helps with calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, and it helps with the nutrient control. But if you've got your protein skimmer dialed in and whatever filtration dialed in, the water change, in my experience, is mostly to rebalance the trace elements. That's really how I look at it. So sometimes I'll do a big water change, even if the tank is clean, just to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm constantly replenishing an even amount of trace elements. Yeah, I think there's this toxic way of thinking, and I'm going to call that in reef keeping, especially when ICP tests came around. And I mean, we've talked about ICP tests. I'm going to talk about them more because they are valuable. Yeah, they but are when great. they first started coming out, people started saying, oh, well, you know, I've tested my water with this higher quality test than I've ever used. It's good. Why do I need to do the water change? Um, just do the water change. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. what I found is some of the water change, like you said, is to rebalance elements. And the thing to consider is how, if you look at the back of whatever salt mix you buy, there's a huge list of elements. So yeah, you could dose 12 different things. More like 40. Yeah, or 40 or yeah. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. Or you crazy. could just do a water change. Yeah. And there is Save all, there's this mentality of like, I hate doing the water change. Yeah. So instead I'm gonna run this test every single month and then I'm gonna dose all these bottles. So that is work. that is ha harder than just doing the water change. It works. It does work. I've seen people who do it, but it is, it, you know, you could just do a water change. Yeah, and I think um, another thing I've kind of realized is, you know, if you have a 6,000 gallon tank at home, it's hard to do big water changes. Yeah. If you have a normal home-sized reef aquarium, let's say 200 gallons or less, it's usually easier just to do water changes. So you could then to test for all those things and try to rebalance them. And the other thing I think people don't give enough credit for is just sucking the garbage out. 
like the amount of detritus that's in your sand, that's in your overflow box, collects in your sump. If you're not doing water changes, it's just going to keep yeah. building up. And sometimes and that doesn't show up in your, your tests. Like yeah, it's not could, dissolved, yeah, it's just you, sitting there. Yeah, you could have a tank that's like full of detritus and you're still testing nitrate zero, phosphate zero, and not have algae too. Like in, in very established aquariums, I've seen Because that something's happen. eating the algae. Like our area. old display tank, yeah. our, our, that old, we had this 150 gallon display tank that was there for like 15 years. It had just the most detritus I'd ever seen, but there was no algae in the tank because there was like tanks and all kinds yeah, of stuff, stuff right? Yeah. So like we had like seven tanks in this tank and they all got along and it was, it was great. And then we, you know, we sold them off over the years and the detritus just pooled in this tank, like behind the rock yeah. structure every week. I'd, I'd suck it all out, blow it out and it just keep pooling. But the nitrate and phosphate tests it wouldn't show up in the water, so. Yeah, th th that's kind of a, a little tirade, I guess, yeah. due to water changes. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that, especially for nano tanks, um, you probably don't need to be concerned with, like a, on the tank right next to you, a little 30 gallon tank. I just change 10 gallons every week, and I don't worry about any trace elements. Because a 30 gallon tank, yeah. you're changing 10 gallons, you don't need to worry. Um, in a bigger tank, you may need to test more. My general advice with trace elements, if you're just kind of getting into it, is either use some system, we yeah. talked about some of yeah. the supplements that have integrated trace elements, yeah. um, or if you're gonna wanna add some individual trace element, don't add any individual trace elements until you get some kind of test. There, there's some elements you can test for yourself, like iodine, there's iodine tests, but there are so many elements that um, you either can't test for, or their tests are so difficult to perform and they're inaccurate, that using an ICP test, which is basically taking a water sample, mailing it to a testing lab who then emails you results, they're gonna give you a much better idea of what your water chemistry is than you're gonna be able to get. And if they confirm that something's low, you can add it. So uh, with uh, the Fauna Marin that I have here, you can use their ICP test, and then they may tell you that you need a specific element like iron. Then add iron. But every home iron test I've ever used is just garbage. <laughs> so I would be hesitant to add iron because adding too much can be bad. And if you don't have a number, I wouldn't add it. But if you're able to send in a test to an ICP facility and they can confirm it's low, then I follow the instructions they give you and add it in. And they're usually pretty detailed too. Like it'll be, it'll say like, add a hundred milliliters over three days. And yeah, yeah, it'll yeah. be, it'll be pretty precise. Yeah, and I think it's kind of, you mentioned some of the other methods. Um, there, there's a lot of them out there. You mentioned the reef moonshiners. That's also, uh, you send in an ICP test and you dose these things. Just, if you're wanting to dose individual trace elements of any brand, back it up with some like lab grade testing. Don't try to do it just on your on a whim. Don't just dose it. <laughs> yeah, and the, the last thing I'll say about it, I don't, I don't mean to beat, beat a dead horse here, is like, in everything in this hobby, there's the extreme, like, advanced perfectionist. So, like, you know, that's could be someone who's sending an ICP every week and then dosing exactly yeah. how they say it. That's, like, the high end. Or it's as simple as, just like I said, when we were talking about the Red Sea program, just following their original recommendation of, of the 1 to 10 ratio of, you know, all the trace elements to your calcium dosage. And, you know, usually that's good enough goes back to like also what I was talking about about like what I was talking about with Lou from Tropic Marin is you don't really know exactly if it's gonna make the tank that much better so just pick a method stick with it and if you enjoy the results then keep doing it yeah I think I'd add in like something we were very conscious of when we were structuring our discussion was just the priority is like first off make sure your coral aren't dying yeah like yeah i can't tell you how many times especially when i worked in the retail shop someone's like um you know i really want my coral to be more colorful and i see a picture and like flesh just peeled off half the oh, skeleton yeah. of this oh, one yeah. and you know this one's bleached out like That's sad actually. so like yeah. don't add any trace elements <laughs> unless you've gotten that taken care of like don't worry about it um same thing with nutrients like we talk about tweaking them to get some color out of it. As long as you have normal range nutrients, um, don't stress out about it. And I, I would say that like, for me, the first thing 
would be making sure you got your lighting good. The next is the nutrients and then the trace elements is last. So just try to keep things prioritized as far as what you're, what you're doing as you try to color your coral on. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, if you liked what you heard today or watched today, if you're on YouTube, please subscribe. You can go ahead and follow us. Um, that way you can make sure you're notified of any future podcasts or episodes that we put out. You can leave us a review, which helps people find us easier. And most importantly, keep buying some stuff from arenareef.com. We're a real reef hobbyist. We appreciate your business, and that's what allows us to keep doing this. And make sure that you help out Gavin. Um, Gavin, where can people um, check out Aquarium Arts? Yeah, so um, our address is 1810 West Baseline Road, Mesa, Arizona. 85202 we're on suite one so we're off of dobson and baseline right next to Rhodes junior high and then if you're looking to shop online my online store is a little inactive right now you can go to www.thereefhotspot.com well thank you very much for joining me thank you hopefully you guys tune in later thank you yeah.